thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, as one or two other people have mentioned, I'd just like to start by thanking Karen for inviting me along, for organising the event, and for uh, producing this fantastic book, which you all must buy, obviously. Which is really interesting. You may or may not know a lot of people in it, but I thought I knew some of the names and faces, and even the ones I did know, I learned a lot more about the individuals. So what it does do is it gives quite a kind of um, personal view on a lot of things that uh, we think we know about. Uh, and that's a theme that is going to be presented in my little section here, which is that with a lot of the data that we look at, a lot of the information, a lot of the um, strategies and formulas that we see that appear to be put onto us, um, there isn't actually a great deal of difference between what is outside and what is inside. So I'm going to propose various things to you today. I'm not going to state anything as fact. I'm not going to state anything empirically or objectively. That isn't kind of how I work. So everything I propose, everything I state is really just supposition, it's conjecture, and it's just my journey shared with you. So um, that's, that's a good kind of tone to set, which I think was probably, for those of you who were here first thing and heard uh, Michael Tassarian's introduction, it's quite key to recognise something here that, in a sense, no one else is doing this stuff. Nobody else is thinking these thoughts. No one else is sharing this energy. In terms of the hierarchy of the societies we live in, we are it. So what happens in this room is special, is different, is significant, and is of great substance. So I echo his words in that what we're doing here is uh, really important and really something that we can uh, kind of congratulate ourselves about. A little pat on the back doesn't help every now and again. So, guerrilla psychonautics, I'm going to tell you what that is in a little bit, but I just want to start off with this interesting guy. William Burroughs, a uh, kind of hero of mine uh, early on, who um, really penetrated the, the matrix, the control system, uh, the strategies of the architects of control, however you want to discuss it, the sorcerers, the, uh, the empire, the illuminati, he knew this stuff, and he knew this stuff in the 50s, and he wrote about it. He knew about ayahuasca in the 50s, and he wrote about it. So he was, to some degree, this gentleman was a pioneer of these subjects. And although there were some academics kind of uh, investigating these subjects, he was really doing it from a very personal point of view, because his information was delivered in the context of fiction. And fiction uh, allows the artist or the visionary to get away with a lot more and suggest a lot more powerful information than if you were putting it forward as, you know, scholarly theory. So I like him. And he said one day, the way to kill a man or a nation is to cut off his dreams. And dreaming is a powerful metaphor for many things in this presentation. So this sets the tone for what I'm going to talk about. Okay. The impulse to believe and bleed through, what does that mean? We are born into this world with a certain amount of purity and a certain amount of perception. And I feel that when we show up on this 3D realm on Earth, we have everything we need. And what happens is, over a process of time, is beliefs get instilled into us that to some degree and in some way separate us from reality. So one of the suggestions I'm going to make for this hour is that as you would if you're going to watch a movie, if you're going to watch Lord of the Rings, or if you're going to watch Avatar, or some fantastical conjuration, is to suspend all belief and all disbelief and just pause it, just pause it. Because as humans, we are conditioned to impulse believe, to think yes or no, truth or bullshit. And that impulse is very difficult to turn down, very difficult to modify. But if we just say, okay, well, I'll turn it on later, but I'm just going to pause it for now. I'm just going to pause all those systems of belief. Even the morality, even the ethics, all that stuff, I'm just going to hold it. I'm just going to put it on hold for a second. And when you do that, there's a sensation that information that comes in doesn't quite affect you in the same way. It doesn't have the same gravitation. So if you look at a classic controversial subject like 9-11, was it an inside job or was it not? Both wrong, both the wrong way of looking at it, I would suggest. Do you believe in extraterrestrials or not? N no, I do. No, I don't. It doesn't actually help 
the process of knowing. It doesn't help the process of gnosis. I'm going to use that word probably a few times, gnosis, and just for those of, of you not familiar with that word, gnosis to me represents a kind of um, contact with an emanation of knowing. The idea that there is a field of knowing around us where everything is contained and all knowledge is there. Some people call it the Akashic field, some people call it the emanation, and this knowing is available. And you don't have to go and acquire it, you just tap into it, and when you connect with it, everything is there. And this process is more substantive and more useful to us than just purely linear acquisition of knowledge. But it doesn't work if you go in with a set of beliefs. So those beliefs, although they may feel that this, you may feel that they serve you well, perhaps they don't. So I'm going to propose that we just pause those for a little while. If we don't, we get bleed through, which is a narrative that unfolds within what you do, which says, this is bullshit. <laughs> and uh, whatever. Or you get the narrative, oh yes, yes, this is it. I'm into this. This is fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. Both of those do not help that Gnostic process, that uh, process of knowing. So I'm going to suggest that we don't do that. If you believe something, you're basically carrying around an anvil inside you. Every time you believe something, you carry it around. Sometimes it weighs you down, sometimes it's a, a cross that you bear like a martyr with you know, fierce resilience and fierce pride. If you take information without belief, it is as light as a feather. It doesn't really affect you that way because you don't have to submit to it. You don't have to acclaim it. You don't have to proclaim it. So everything that I'm going to suggest, everything that I'm going to put forward is as this second thing, is as just pure energy, just information, just words, just little particles just drifting through. And when you see things in that way, just as a kind of Native American guy would do with a headdress, you can carry a lot of feathers without too much trouble. You can carry lots and lots of them, it doesn't really matter. And over time, feathers that you like you keep and feathers that you don't like you throw away. Whereas with the belief system, with the weight, with the gravity, you can only do that for so long. And it's in this simple image that I share with you now that we see why a lot of our friends and family and societies and communities and nations have so much trouble with the things that we know in our hearts, the things that we share today, the important matters of this changing world. If you do it all as belief, you can only really do so much before somebody goes, no, I can't really take any more, thanks very much, I'll see you next week, whatever. So it's really important that we understand that. Okay, I'm going to talk about sorcery. Sorcery is uh, a system of movement of energy. Sorcery is a process of knowing. Sorcery is a process of looking at the world in a different way. Now, many people associate sorcery with people like this. And in the consensus reality tunnel, if I may use that expression, sorcery has kind of gained this negative aspect. And people think, um, you know, it's a bad thing. A sorcerer is a bad thing. Maybe a magician's a good thing, a wizard's a good thing, but a sorcerer sounds bad. Not so, not so. The word sorcery really derives, um, in etymological terms, from the root source, a Latin word which just means fate or oracle. So a sorcerer is somebody who deals in the future, in, in um, information that lies outside the present moment. So it's nothing more than that, a seer. So this meme plex, and by meme I mean a set of ideas, and a plex is a group of ideas. This meme plex associated with sorcery is really this kind of psychological operation that really is kind of leftovers from a very intentional Christian Catholic mass extermination of uh, the indigenous sorcerers and shamanic practices of Europe in the 15th century onwards. And whenever I talk about Christians or Catholics or Jews or whatever, I'm not talking about the people, I'm not talking about people who practice that faith, no problem with any of that. I'm talking about the people who run these things from a top of the pyramid from a hierarchical point of view, far removed from anybody's community vision of any religion. So it's never about religion and race and any of this stuff, not at all. I would assume you would know that. So this, uh, this persecution began with um, Pope John XXII, way back before even the previous slide in 1320, when 
this persecution of what was at the time referred to as something different, but what we now call witchcraft, um, was, was basically pointed out as something that f anything that fell outside the religious context was exterminated. And this specific term, sorcery, was the focus of what we now understand as the Inquisition. And this was a definite sociological manipulation that preyed on what's essentially superstitions of a, a completely uneducated populace. When you go back that far, most people couldn't read, couldn't communicate in a sophisticated manner. And so superstition had much more uh, gravity and much more weight than it does now. And superstition could destroy a community, it could destroy individuals with no problem. So it's a powerful force to harness. And in my studies I feel and see that this was specifically designed to eradicate um, this gnosis, this natural knowledge from man, uh, completely take it out of the social conversation, completely take it out of our minds. And so when we say shamanism, we perhaps imagine people in Peru or people in Siberia or people in you know, Native American context. Not necessarily so. Not necessarily that is something that is a popular modern interpretation of that. But shamanism, I would say, is indigenous to every country, indigenous to every continent. And that shamanic impulse is something that is naturally occurring within all of us. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that as we go on. So it was this guy who uh, I think Henrik mentioned one of his predecessors, uh, ironically entitled Pope Innocent VIII, who authorised these two inquisitors, Kramer and Sprenger, to systemise the persecution of witches. And they authored this uh, kind of famous text called Hexenhammer, as it's become most commonly known now, or Malleus Maleficarum, Hammer Against Witches. And it was basically a treatise on what is a witch, why it is evil, and how we can destroy it with complete and total lawful abandon. So this church-sanctioned um, extermination basically wiped out hundreds of thousands of people, and that is a conservative estimate. In reality, when you look at... Um, kind of community level information that isn't officially sanctioned that could stretch into the millions but we just we just don't know but what we do know is that this process lasted for over 300 years and it spread all across Europe and even into America and now this is key women were specifically targeted in this women and this separation of woman from the land basically wiped out this kind of morphic field this sympathy that the female energy has with the land and has with what we would call supernatural or magical forces. And this was, the, this was the plan, to take that out. And at the time it was pretty exclusively in women, that kind of intuitive, natural, shamanic impulse. Perhaps today we can say, as kind of you know, modern, cool guys, that we can have the female energy flowing through us. It's a little bit different now but it obviously resonated most strongly in women, so at the time they were targeted specifically. And that effect basically has lasted, it has moved on to the present time. And women are sidelined very often in the community as not being able to compete with a lot of the reductionist nuts and bolts materialism that men seem to do. So all this left brain, right brain dialectic, you know, there's a, a specific switch to that. <coughs> So sorcery, uh, this is, this, that was the negative meme plex. What I would say, this is, Mike's gone a bit weird. What I would say is that um, in both the European and Mesoamerican uh, concepts of sorcery, it's very simple. And it is this, that the world, the world of everyday life, the reality that we see unfold around us is not real. And in fact it is not external to us which in physics now is beginning to be, you know, leaked into the mainstream. But at the time, you know, 20,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, this was revolutionary thinking. So the, the apprentice is taught how to see through this fake construct, this matrix, to see through it rather than just look at it, rather than just see it for what we think it is, to, pay, to pierce it, to penetrate it. So real sorcery focuses on refining our own energetic movement through this construct. And there are a number of basic techniques for this. Dynamics, energy dynamics, that when we understand these, make this process of seeing much more easy to understand. And I'm going to share 
some of my thoughts about that today. Okay, so before we move into that, again, to balance the polarity on the other side of it, this is an important concept, neophobic shutdown. Now, this is the process I have labelled for people who do not want to look at any strange new information. This is for those people, those intelligent, loving, normal people in our lives who don't want to hear your theories and don't want to hear about the interesting books that you'd like to share with them. They don't want to hear about the conferences you've been to and about the political uh, shenanigans that go on. They don't want to hear about the weather systems that are being manipulated. And very often we wonder why. Why don't you want to at least look at this information? So this neophobia, this fear of the new energies, fear of new changing information, is purposefully propagated through the system, through the construct, to make it difficult for people to assess and access and reevaluate new information. And there's a mechanic to this which begins to explain it. So what causes people to cling to these old systems? Paradigms that we all know are false, that we in this room perhaps have faced, that a lot of people do not face. And there's a number of key things. Fear, we can imagine why that is. Fear is every headline, every newspaper, every top story, every scoop of the ABC networks and the CNN, ABC, uh, BBC, ITV, Sky, whatever. Everything is fear-based. So fear is a classic system to fragment the psyche. When the psyche fragments, it's more suggestible. Cognitive dissonance, the uncomfortable feeling when we simultaneously hold two opposing ideas. For most people, that creates kind of neurological depression, mini depression that they do not want. How do you stop it? You just don't think about that stuff. Previous investment, this is a key one, very interesting. If somebody has spent all their life investing in a system, investing in a paradigm that is false, it's very difficult to retreat from that, very difficult to back out from it. So if you paid your taxes all your life and you've created a nice situation with your mortgage, uh, your insurance, your pension, everything's cool, the situation, your local political situation is acceptable, is doable. Why would you want to retreat from that? Why would you want to reevaluate that system? And the older you get, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, the harder that gets, the more you've invested in it, the less the self wants to retreat and reevaluate. And the final one in this sounds very straightforward, but it's cunningly shrewd in how this is unfolded upon us, an inability to focus. If you watch TV for any amount of time, which I wouldn't recommend, the first thing you see is cut, 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 the camera cuts, sound cuts, voices change, angles change, everything is fast. That is the style. If you watch an action movie now, it's so fast, you can't see what's going on. They even started to remove frames in adverts to show this movement, this incredibly fast cut edit. And that also makes its way into text, into syntax. But the language that is used now in so-called news broadcasts, which I prefer to call official broadcasts because that's what they are, the language is quick, is cut down. Any, any sort of pause, any sort of consistency, any movement of peace and stillness is completely unbroadcastable nowadays. It has to be quick. And what this does is reduce our ability to focus it reduces our ability to create, to manifest. Because without focus, we cannot do anything. So neophobia indicates the process whereby people choose to stop evolving. It's not necessarily forced upon them. It is proposed to them and they accept it. So it's a choice to stop evolving. And this is strongly associated with heavy, heavy consumption of the mainstream media. People who watch a lot of television, who read all the magazines, who read the newspapers, who go to the movies, who talk about the new, latest headlines and this story and that story, are basically propping up this whole construct. They're passing these negative memes on all the time. And anybody who has experimented with moving themselves away from mainstream media, you realise something very interesting happens. I was in... Uh, states recently speaking in various locations and um, one guy came up to me and said oh yeah he said uh, 
I stopped watching TV a year ago. It's really interesting. I've started I'm reading more, spending more time with my children. Um, I've taken up painting. I've visited these countries. And just life is so much richer and truer and freer. It's just uh, it's more human. You know, it's just better. So I don't watch the news anymore. The news is irrelevant, irrelevant to me. He said, what matters to me is what I see in my life. And if I want to know about a certain country, I will find out about that myself. I don't need it broadcast to me. I will find it. If I want to know about a political situation, I will find it. I will go on the net. I will visit it. I'll go to the library, whatever. But the most interesting thing he said of all this stuff was his wife hadn't managed to unplug from the TV. And um, what they'd agreed to do was put the TV on a trolley, a little rolling trolley, right? And he said, all I ask you to do is not have it in the living room. So she'd been kind of, uh, you know, putting this in another room, watching TV, and they'd agreed to do this between themselves. And then one day, one Saturday night, she said, look, balls to that. I'm going to watch it on the sofa, in the living room. It's a big program that I love. Tough shit, I'm going to watch it. And he said, OK. And this program was... Um, popular program, I believe, called NCIS, right? which is about uh, forensic examination and crime solving and stuff like that. Very popular in the States and here. And this guy, who had not watched any television for a year, said he had resensitized. He had resensitized himself emotionally, physically, spiritually. And when he watched this program, he said it was like a vision of hell. He said there was brains being splattered all over the TV. There was rape. There was murder. There was base, crude, pornographic images on the screen. He said this was on like Channel 4 or whatever at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. Children watch it. And his wife was completely oblivious to it because she was desensitized. Like anybody who watches TV is desensitized to these images. It is acceptable entertainment to watch people get their head blown off. So this is neophobia. This is how it works. There are a number of ways to combat this. Anyone who's familiar with my work may have heard of this concept, this little, uh, this little routine that I've um, really formulated from other systems that I've seen and just put it into my own language. Um, I refer to it as the gates of awakening, which is always a very personal thing, so this does not necessarily work for everybody, but it worked for me. It can be summed up in these four processes, engage, unveil, expand, integrate. So briefly what these mean. Engagement is the first stage of Gnosis. And engagement is essentially an ongoing, lifelong self-education process. A decision to learn, a decision to know, a decision to evolve that we make personally. No university gives a monkeys about this stuff. It's nothing to do with academia. This is a personal thing. Self-motivated, enthusiastic study of subjects that matter. And choose those words carefully, because we know what the subjects that matter are. And they are embedded within many things that we all have some interest in some of those things. And there's lots and lots of them. Philosophy, astronomy, etymology, chemistry, whatever it is. Things to engage with. Things that mean something. So this engagement process is very straightforward to get into. It's a decision, a personal decision to make. The next stage in this process is the unveiling stage, and there are two types of this. One is a dark unveiling. This is essentially an acknowledgement that there are secret societies, elites, families, naughty people who like to keep control and who like to hide their knowledge. And my way of describing this is that any illuminism, any secrecy in itself is not bad. It just depends who the people are in those groups. Secrecy is just a way of protecting knowledge in one way. Illuminism is a system of enlightenment. But in the way that we see it, in the dark sense, that this is, as you can see by the slide, it's characterized by this extreme stratification of knowledge and technology through hierarchical forms of distribution. So if you ever analyze illuminist groups, there is extreme hierarchy, extreme organization. And these people are indeed a synthesis of solar symbolism, ancient mystery cults, and numerology. And anyone who doesn't know that, that's cool, but you just haven't looked into it far enough. The further you go back, the more obvious this becomes. The further you look into it, the more apparent and more transparent it is. 
It is a fact, it is the case. And you'll see this, pieces of this in this, other things that speakers have said today. You will see how far some of this stretches back when you listen to Ralph's talk later on. So all the different conjurations of that, Knights of Malta, the OTO, the Jesuits, whatever. The globalist groups, Council on Foreign Relations, Tavistock, think tanks, all that kind of stuff. Many of these systems exist. And then the broader themes within that, conspiracy, psychological operations, assassinations, media manipulation. These are dark unveilings. Dark is not bad, but it's dark. It's like night. So if you stay completely in that realm, that will affect your resonance as a human being. It will affect your consciousness. So this is part of a cycle. It's part of a process. It's not an end in itself. To dwell completely in this realm is foolish. And you can probably think about people in the media or people you even know in the alternative uh, community who do dwell in dark unveilings and you can see it. You can see the negativity in it. They only take, they never give. It's all take. The other stage is the light unveilings. These are more illuminated realizations. The universe is magical and mysterious. This 3D world is only one representation of what we see in front of our eyes. It's not the only thing, it's nested within other realms. When we analyze history, history has got a lot of clues there. It is radically different to anything we thought. And again, you'll see this in some of the presentations later on. Consciousness creates reality. Consciousness is like, you know, such a buzzword now, it's almost, I'm almost sick of saying it. But it's important to know that what happens in our spirit, what happens that emanates from us, affects everything around us and is actually primary. It's not epiphenomenal from what's happening in our brain, it is primary. There is no separation between any energetic entities, whether it's a cup or a person or a tree or a galaxy. Everything is an energetic entity and everything is intimately connected. There is no separation. Expansion, this is the third stage. You've engaged with subjects, you've un unveiled information, uncovered it. Expansion is now about turning that to the inner world, to the self to the soul, whatever word you want to choose, to work on yourself, to clean yourself. There's so much contamination, so much toxicity in everything we see and do. It's important to know how to ground, how to clean that, how to rewire bad wiring from people who put that upon us, not with any ill intent necessarily, or any sort of you know, particular sinister aspect, but it is bad wiring that has to be addressed. Meditation, connection with nature, entheogenic work, I'll come to that word in a minute. Learning to perceive the universe as a communication system that is personally, elegantly, beautifully designed to speak to you individually. It speaks all the time. It communicates all the time with us. And there's a way of seeing those communications and understanding what it means. The linear left brain thinking, the intellect, the systemic process of reduction, reducing everything to nuts and bolts, that has to be quietened. It has to be brought still. Softening the boundaries of self to understand that it is not Neil Kramer going through the world, it is not Bob Smith, it is not Sarah Green. It is a story, it is a narrative unfolding, only that, only that. During this process we see something, knowing begins to replace the predominance of thinking. So connection with Gnosis directly as an experience replaces the act of trying to acquire knowledge, trying to acquire information. And this is only understood experientially. Finally, integration. Walking the path every day. Acknowledging source and experiencing its unfoldment. Source being where we come from, whatever that means to you. Balancing selfhood and individuality with a fluid connection with the field. Attunement with one's own highest frequency of consciousness. This is walking the walk. This is actually doing it every day, every moment, being vigilant, thinking about everything, feeling everything, seeing, stopping thought when it needs to be stopped, firing it up when it needs to be ramped up. So this process looks like this. 
And it's a cycle. It doesn't start one, two, three and end with four. It continually goes round. It's useful to know where you are. Look at that. Look at it. You know where you are in that. You know your challenges. You know what you need to do. You know your weaknesses. You know your strength. And that's good. It helps to make sense of a lot of things to just put it into this model temporarily while everything else is on pause just to think about it. So zooming the spiral, this is interesting, this moves us into kind of more far out territory now. Process for me that I see often is a zooming, zoom levels I call it. As you're born you start here like this and you see only yourself, you see only pain and pleasure and food and loneliness or separation or heat or warmth, just basic low down Maslow hierarchy physiological need. As you grow older you start to appreciate more, see more. As you grow older still, 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, etc, etc. You begin to become more conscious of everything around you and see that actually you affect things, you influence things. Everything is kind of interconnected. The idea of this is by the time you get to 80, 90, 100, whatever the end of your life is for you, that you're at the maximum zoom level. You see everything with the utmost clarity. And people whose life has been unexpectedly foreshortened accelerate this process and they see beauty where we do not see beauty. They see hope where we see none because they zoom out more. They see further and deeper. So these are some basic thoughts that fit into what I'm going to talk about, guerrilla psychonautic. Guerrilla meaning basically from the Spanish word guerrilla. <coughs> guerrilla warfare is basically this system of uh, combat which is asymmetrical in nature. It's used for small forces to combat larger forces. Probably most popularized in the modern psyche by uh, Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution. And guerrilla warfare has tactics and there's kind of like a number of key things. And when I looked over these recently, I, it struck me that they are extremely useful for non-physical combat warfare, for psychic penetration, for conscious warfare, to combat the system, to combat the construct. So these are actually physical laws for physical combat. But I'm going to ask you to look at them in a slightly different way. Number one, intelligence. Know yourself and know your enemy. Initiative. Be creative, adaptable and fluid. Intensity. Choose when and when not to engage the enemy. Relationships. Connect with the people. So this is within the context of a small fighting unit fighting a large arm. And you can see why those would be useful. But can, it, can you not also see how these are useful for the individual, for the person who accepts selfhood, for the person who is becoming more conscious? Move with speed and stealth. Travel light and use only what you need. Know the natural environment. Know safe places. These are all things that transfer most smoothly for me into the conscious realm. So these, uh, these systems which prove so successful uh, for the Cubans in many ways um, can also be transposed to the individual level. So the other part of that term, psychonautics, psychedelic is probably the term some people have, uh, would associate with that. Psyche basically coming from a Greek root which means soul, centre of life, uh, mind, psyche, whatever. Um, and to manifest this, so mind manifesting is psychedelic which is this term you know, predominant in the 60s. Psychonaut is, again from that word, where soul is the correct interpretation of it and naught being sailor. So a psychonaut is a soul sailor. A person who induces altered states of consciousness with varying methods, techniques, natural, organic, synthetic, whatever, in order to investigate existence, to address the spiritual. Psychoactive, a chemical substance that alters consciousness like chocolate cake or psilocybin mushrooms. Both alter consciousness. So psychoactive is not necessarily a powerful hallucinogen that will knock you out of everything into something else. It is something that changes consciousness. And there are many psychoactive substances. Here's a few of them. You may be aware of one or two or ten or twenty, but there are hundreds of these things. These are just some of the more popular ones. So we've all heard of acid. We've all heard of ecstasy. We've all heard of... Um, cannabis and then there is these other ones that come in like DMT uh, 
And then the wrappers around those, like ayahuasca, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, liberty caps, um, all these substances are beginning to come into the mainstream. Sting talks about his revolutionary experience in the Amazon with ayahuasca. It's in the mainstream. And terminology for the psychedelics themselves, so many words for it, and here are some of them. The kind of catchy one at the moment I quite like is entheogens. Or entheogens. Native, pe native peoples often refer to these as sacred plants or sacred medicines, because that's what they are, they are medicine. And as with a medicine, it is designed to be medicinal and not dietary. It's not something you do all the time. It's not something you do to prop up a failing system. It's something you do to use as a medicine, as instruction to reboot a mechanism, to reboot a technique in oneself. So entheogen basically means a substance that causes one to become inspired, to bring in the divine, again from those, those Greek roots. This brings me to the crux of this, which um, I call the object of, uh, well, I think it's called transdimensional existence, but I couldn't fit that nicely on one line, so. The object of existence. This is what many people consider as life. The mainstream 3D temporal lifeline. And it looks like this. And if you read any mainstream information, they reinforce this every day. They reinforce everything and say, well, the bit in the middle, try and make it as pleasant as possible. Yeah? Try and make that work for you. Try and make it nice. And I'm going to suggest that when we remove the temporal, when we remove time from this equation, and we go back to those zoom levels, zooming the spiral, zoom out on that fractal spiral, I'm going to suggest to you that Existence is better thought of, better conceived of, as an object. So let us imagine that there is this vast, extraordinary, elegant, dynamic object. A huge, enormous, beautiful creation. Three-dimensional, multi-dimensional. And it exists, and we are somewhere inside it, somewhere upon it. But when you are upon it, like an ant on a mountainside, you have no concept of the object itself, only your space on it. You can only see what's in front of your nose. So we're zoomed out here, let's say, zoomed out a million times. So if we zoom in a little bit more, I say, okay, yeah, we'll zoom into the construct. We'll zoom in a little bit more and see all these amazing fractalated spaces. This is what happens with a lot of entheogenic exploration. You zoom out too far and you kind of think, what is that? You zoom in a little bit more, you say, okay, that's the Milky Way, right? Yeah, I know what that is. Oh, right, okay, I don't know if you can see this too well. That's Earth, yeah, okay, that's England. Oh, good, all oh, right, yeah, I can, I, I'm starting to understand it now. That's a city. That's London, that's Tower Bridge, that's the Gherkin, etc. So we understand that this object of existence, our perception of it depends entirely on the level of zoom we have upon it. So if we analyse one area of it, let's say that little, um, that little dot here. Say we're, say we're there. There we go. Can't do that with my left hand. This is in a 3D space. From a fourth dimensional space, which is where you have to go, which excludes time altogether, you can zoom out and see it. You can zoom out further and see more. You can zoom out even further and see more. And you'll see that on this little representation that I drew here, you can not only see what's immediately within that circle, but you can see what's around it as well. We would call that the past and the future, alternative realities, whatever. And we could give names to these things. We could call them orbits. So different things would take to different orbits. We could call them frequencies, another catchy word at the moment, resonance, frequencies, used a lot, but they are useful. And we could call them whatever we want, frequency G, R, P, whatever. And we could say, certain chemical substances that affect the electrochemical patterning in our brain will help us get to those spaces, those orbits, like psilocybin, salvinorin, DMT. So we're saying here that there's something we can't normally see. Why can't we normally see it? Do we need drugs to do this? Is that, is that really necessary? No, it isn't necessary. What these entheogens do is show us a mechanism that has been drummed out of us. 
So the brain we see basically as a neurological computer all too often. That's what it does. But what it also is is a filtering system. So what I see is the potential for a massive amount of information, of data, of energy to flow into us. But it's blocked by a series of filters. And we can give names to some of those filters. Social normalizing, mainstream uneducation, control system conditioning, sensorial containment, dimensional containment. So the smart person will look at that without any need of anything else to say, well, yeah, social normalizing is not necessary. I will do what I want, thank you. Mainstream uneducation. As soon as you begin to educate yourself and take it upon yourself to become intellectual, to become apprised of the information, to become smart, you realize that the mainstream system is not concerned with educating us, quite the reverse. So we can do away with that. Control system conditioning. The fact that we're just little people and we can't do anything. That we're on this one-dimensional timeline. We can do away with that. If we're really smart, we can do away with it. Where the entheogens come into their own is in this sensorial containment. The fact that we are supposedly trapped in a world of sense, in Maya, in the world of sensory information. Entheogens can help to do something about that, to temporarily remove it and show how that isn't necessarily the case. Dimensional containment, to move you out of your temporal time zone as a three-dimensional human being. When you do that, you think, oh, okay, yeah, now I can see the whole thing. Now I can see the object of trans-dimensional existence because I do not have those filters in place. So this is a process that is designed to be completely natural, completely organic. It does not require anything external. And so why are these substances there? They're there to remind us of a process that we can do completely organically. I was speaking about this with a lady earlier. She says, I can see things. I can see energies. I can do stuff. I don't need those. And I said, that is fantastic because you represent what it should be like. Some people need a kick up the ass. See, I've been in America. Arse. Sorry, that's better. Um, some people need a reminder. Again, this comes down to male-female. Males have a distinct disadvantage in this case. The way males are trained to be brought up in this country and others is as reductionists, nuts and bolts thinkers. You cannot get anywhere solely with that rationale. Critical reason is important but it has a space and it has a place and it has a time and it has a frequency. Women tend to have more intuitive faculties that go openly throughout the whole life. As I move through my life, I find that most women I meet remain open-minded for the duration of their life. Most men tend to shut down more and more every 10, every seven years, whatever. Now this is changing. The flow of energies between the two, the female and the male within any individual, is becoming more harmonic, more reliable, more consistent. So what this teaches us is that it isn't just the mind that sees, it isn't just the eyes that see, it's the body. The body as a system of aerials, body as percipient. And as you may have uh, seen in other systems, the body houses a system of energy portals. There are seven key ones, there are another seven subtle ones, another seven even more subtle ones, but these are the main ones. And they have specific functions. So if all your energy is being filtered through the brow and the throat, then you'll do well, because you can communicate well, you have some kind of psychic impulse. But unless all those portals are open, the energy that we talk about cannot flow through the system properly. You miss parts of the spectrum. And these portals, of course, as you guessed, are more commonly kind of known as chakras, spinning wheels of energy, also known as seals, vans, assemblage points, decoders, vortices, whatever. But they are there. And they represent a potential energy interpretation in the body that goes below the level of words, below the level of information, as pure energy. And significantly, this portal here that we would associate with what we call the heart, which isn't really anything to do with the heart, but that's that meme, we associate with it, because it works on an emotional feeling level, to use those words, is distinctly female, and it has the biggest, furthest reach of any system. 
it can reach from across the planet, across the galaxy. It's the most powerful thing we have, is that portal. Everything else is secondary to that. Everything else is secondary to that. If the heart portal is not open, we are silenced. So the most important thing to do is to be aware of that and to understand that that valve can be opened and closed as appropriate. We don't have to turn into space bunnies and just hop about blissfully everywhere waiting for 2012 unitary consciousness because that won't necessarily happen and it won't necessarily help us. We have to learn how to switch these energy portals on and off, open and close them as necessary. And going back to this perspective on the object of existence, that is the reach from that heart portal, from truth, from impeccability, from authentic being. That is what flows through that energy level. Anything that is inauthentic begins to shut down the other portals. Salvia is an interesting entheogen. It's still uh, legal here in the UK at the moment. I bought some over the counter also in New York uh, last month. Totally legal, totally fine. This is what it looks like in its native habitat. It's a sage mint plant, very beautiful. Basically, it comes from Oaxaca in Mexico, in an isolated mountain regions, typically very wet, drenched areas. There's a long tradition of usage by the Mazatec shamans. It can be smoked, chewed, you can make a tea or a tincture from it. The primary psychoactive component of this is a thing called salvinorin A, which was only recently really uncovered. There's a guy called Daniel Siebert who has uh, done a lot of uh, sterling work on this front and extracted this, and you can make a, an extract of it because actually doing things with the plant is very difficult and time-consuming and problematical. And it's uh, known as a kappa opioid receptor agonist. Um, basically, most other visionary plants are alkaloids and affect different receptors in the brain. This one is unusual. It's the only one that tickles that receptor. And salvia is very interesting. I mean, on the street, not on the street, but in the stores, it looks like this. You get a little container about that big and it's got what looks like, you know, sage that you'd put on, a, on your cooking or whatever. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. And it can be, uh, as you say, as I said earlier, it can be created in a number of different formats. The effects of salvia are very interesting. It brings about a deep recapitulation process very often. It helps you revisit stuff in your life, not necessarily just childhood memories, anything, but specifically those first formative seven or 14 years. We would call that regressive therapy nowadays. Salvia does that. Visions of moving through membranes are often associated with this, the feeling of moving through things, moving through dimensional spaces, I would say, from the 3D to a space where there is no time. Being in several locations at once, this is what physicists may call multidimensionality particle being in two spaces at the same time, quantum bilocation, whatever. Encounters with other beings, contact with inorganic beings, non-carbon based life forms. Classic effects of salvia, this happens a lot. Um, it's extremely important to note with any entheogenic information that you hear from me or anyone else, all this stuff requires discipline, intelligence, courage, responsibility, <coughs> and a certain amount of integrity. And if any one of those things is lacking, this is a foolish path for anybody to even consider. So any recreational use of this is pointless. It's not a recreational substance, it doesn't work like that. Any entheogen needs those five characteristics to be brought into any meaningful experience. Anything that has dubious or illegal uh, connotations also, we don't want to get locked up for doing anything like this. So one has to be very careful. Recently, uh, these guys here from various uh, rather esteemed places in this kind of uh, realm of therapeutic uh, research in uh, pharmacology, ethnopharmacology, ethnobotany, have made some suggestions about salvia divinorum. They suggest that it may help treat Alzheimer's. There's growing evidence to show that bipolar disorder, which is increasingly afflicting this country and the States and obviously many other places, but those that we hear most about. Uh, addiction to substances. William Burroughs, who I mentioned at the beginning, he took ayahuasca, 
or Yahe as it was known then, or telepathy even before then, as a measure to try and offset, to try and mitigate his heroin addiction, which had great success. And even more stunning, it has been known to put cancer into spontaneous remission. Very, very interesting, very, very worthy of research. And yet a proposed Schedule 1 classification will effectively terminate any further clinical studies of this. In New York, probably this time next year, you will not be able to get salvia legally anymore. And if any, any substance is put on this Schedule 1, as with uh, LSD, there were incredible studies done with uh, Timothy Leary before he went kind of mainstream uh, to deal with uh, addiction, to deal with cancer, to deal with uh, relationship issues, to take hardened criminals and reverse that impulse to show them humanity through this, these substances. That research is almost, almost impossible if it's Schedule 1. Now when we talk about entheogens, about these sacred plants, we often come across rather interesting situation, common frequencies. And what I mean by this is, as we see that there is this field that surrounds us, this dimensional space where all things are possible, where all information is, this field of consciousness that interpenetrates everything, with the brain really as a transceiver, receiving and transmitting in and out of it, we could say that it doesn't really just exist in our brain. It's not really in our heads. They're not just visual cortex spasms. There is something there. There is some connection there with something of substance, something meaningful. And this process of connection to the field I call field uplink, logically enough. And field uplink can occur completely spontaneously on a mountainside, just at peace, at stillness, in meditation, making love, uh, eating extraordinary chocolate cake, whatever. This field uplink moves you out of self and into the greater whole. And we know that greater whole, that object of existence, is so fantastic, so immense. It's just a question of the zoom level of what we see. And within this, within this entheogenic exploration, there are these certain frequencies, holographic operating frequencies. That's what they are. Kind of like radio stations. And again, we could give names to them. We could section them off and say, oh, W, X, Y, Z. And very often when people take a specific entheogen, they will go to a specific frequency and it isn't in their heads, it's in the field. And what happens is they see the same stuff. They see archetypal images, specific iconography. Very often people who take ayahuasca will see the serpent, the serpent form. Not necessarily snakes writhing around or scary kind of black mambas or whatever, but a serpent form, a serpent energy. As they move through this, they realize that what actually happens is it's not in their heads and wow, spooky, we had the same experience. Of course you did, because you're watching the same entheogenic radio station, the same TV station. It exists in the field. Okay. So many different entheogens help us to tune into these different frequencies, help us to get to the same spaces. And everything has its own special frequencies, tonalities, dreamscape, imaginal landscape. Okay, I'm going to speed this up now, because we've only got five minutes left. It might be seven minutes, actually, so. Shadow predation. This is very quickly, big subject. I'm going to absolutely race through this, so forgive me. If you want to talk about this, you know, catch me outside in a short while. Shadow predation. Within this field, within this object of existence that we're all in, within this amazing nested set of realities, within this grand fractal spiral, the suns, the galaxies, the huge, m enormous multiverse around us, we zoom in again into the Milky Way, into the energies that flow through our system, our locality. Specific frequencies, one specific frequency is of interest, one specific level of consciousness here on our planet. Shadow predation. Humans can be conditioned to emit a pressurized, low resonance consciousness through the manipulation of our senses, our perception. And this low consciousness is a power source or a food. 
And this is achieved through collapsing everything we see, as I said, with a belief system into A or B, one or zero, true or false. And this devolves consciousness into a state of separated inertia. It stops us seeing, it stops us creating. We only take, we only consume, we no longer create. And when you do not create, you are just food. This shadow predation, this negative programming is sometimes referred to as the foreign installation as a clue as to what this is about in that term. So who are the predators? What are they? In Gnosticism they call the Archons and it's described as the servants of the Demiurge. A false god who said, I created all this and there is no other god. But he was a lower god and he wasn't very nice. And the servants, the energies that uh, assisted him are the Archons. Multiple sources in Gnosticism and in shamanic Toltec sources and other Mesoamerican traditions refer to them as inorganic beings. Castaneda in his uh, imaginal texts, some of it true, some of it imaginal, whatever, referred to them as the flyers, or in other Toltec tradition, the mud, mud shadows. And some parallels have been drawn in my studies and in other people's studies with the Anunnaki, extraterrestrial races and other creation myth deities. Characteristics of these, impersonal, non-human, powerful, they are tunnels. They're not entities closed off, they are tunnels, wormholes. And there are two types in the Gnostic scripture which date back to, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. The Nag Hammadi text are specific in saying there is a fetal grey type and a reptilian type. Interesting, interesting. They do not have their own defined will. They envy our higher consciousness. They envy what we can do. They envy the divine lineage that every single one of us has, that they do not. The cultivation of our human capacity for inner silence and focus, that word focus, consistent focus, dissolves this influence. And many researchers and many Gnostic scholars suggest that they've been here for a long time, from the beginning, nothing new. And they dwell at this dimensional gateway. They're out there in the orbit from the trans-dimensional object. They're out there, way out there, way out there, but they're there. And they represent for me what I call optimal negative polarity. And one researcher has suggested that these flyers are an essential part of the universe. They're meant to test us. They are the universe's method of providing the ultimate negative source to test us. So we should see them for what they are. I'm going to fast forward through this. Project Bluebeam, holographic technology, weather control, tectonic plate simulation, frequency control, simulating religious prophecies. Some people say this was used on 9-11. Interesting when you consider the archons with Bluebeam. Bluebeam may be used to simulate an alien invasion in 2012 or thereabouts. Very far out stuff. Belief system is not required here. The ultimate psychological operation to initiate a one world system of government, economy, military and religion. Now, for the Archons this would be a disaster if actually an alien visitation did occur. A gentle, kind one. Non-human advanced intelligence came, it would pose a serious threat to their power system. So it would be desirable for them to um, depict all alien visitors as invaders. So blue beam may, may be used, but it may be used to hide a higher system of alien visitation. We don't know. We have to understand this within the context of this framework, these gates as I propose it. So that is a dark unveiling. To dwell in it solely is foolish. So in closing, I want to put forward the following two aspects on this, the following two perspectives. Any shadow force in our world, any darkness, any badness, however you want to look at it, is us. We are the shadow. We are complicit in the existence of all external adversaries. They represent for us the disavowal of our own shadow, the collective projection of our stuck energy. It's only by going within that we can disperse these patterns that ultimately do emanate out from us. Any darkness is just a representation of constantly ignoring our own shadow side. 
Shadow is not bad, the shadow is shadow. Shadow is darkness, that's all it is. And this is the natural play of polarity within this fractal spiral that we live in. This is natural, it's normal, it's organic. So we are the shadow, but we are also the light. It's the same thing. Acknowledging source, acknowledging the divinity within us, whether you call it source, whether you call it God, the divine, the goddess, Sophia, whatever your system of information is, acknowledging that dissolves submissive consciousness and empowers the individual to be able to create. Recognizing our own immutable sovereignty liberates our spirit from the constructs. They can't touch us when we are sovereign beings. Nobody can. So we're no longer subjects. We become the master, our own master. Bringing consciousness into everything we do, however great, however dynamic, however small, however trivial, positively affects everything and everybody we come into contact with. It's the most elegant, dynamic, extraordinary weapon we have against any system that we don't like. It's a thing that we have inside us that we undervalue. Being conscious and bringing consciousness into what we do spells the end for any construct that doesn't advantage us, that doesn't help us. So these three things, acknowledge source, recognize your sovereignty, bring consciousness into everything you do with all the systems we've looked at, all the substances, all the techniques, all the information, all the reality models, all the philosophy, those three simple things spell the end for any system which is not for us. Thank you very much for listening.